So good afternoon. Um, I'm speaking on the uh, co-integration of uh, quartz, a quartz uh, structure for OCXO and uh, silicon NIMS inertial sensors. Um, this program was about a year program uh, that we got going under a seedling under DARPA funding. And um, so we had to hurry to do everything that we needed to do. The genesis, however, actually started about 10 years ago uh, in conversations that I had with uh, Tom Kenny, who was uh, at that time uh, one of the uh, DARPA MTO program managers. And we discussed uh, the uh, advantages of uh, integrating timing devices and with inertial devices, and there was uh, several uh, error correction schemes that we envisioned of improving the performance of the overall system. Um, and uh, it didn't uh, find traction within uh, DARPA under Tony Tether at the time, but a couple of uh, program managers uh, later uh, under Andre Chiquel, um it finally found a home and it actually turned into the uh, micro uh, PNT program that was a large focus program within DARPA, and uh, that uh, spun off uh, quite a few different uh, programs in the micro PNT uh, uh, area, precision navigation and timing. And it sort of seems apropos too to hear all of the uh, uh, relativity talks and talk about space time, and so there's that connection between space and time. And here we're talking about integrating clocks in with inertial sensors. So there's uh, sort of a commonality, common theme. Um, so uh, I'll start by uh, asking the question, can we integrate uh, quartz MIMS with silicon MIMS? Uh, we typically hear about quartz at this uh, conference, and we hear about uh, MIMS, and MIMS usually implies silicon MIMS. Um, hopefully at the end of the talk, um, you'll be convinced it's just MIMS. You can use uh, quartz, you can use silicon, you can use polysilicon aluminum nitride, those are just materials that get folded into a MIMS process. Um, but uh, going into the program, uh, there was some question about whether, um, whether we could do this. Uh, why would we want to do this? Well, quartz makes good uh, oscillators, good clocks, as we know. Uh, silicon MIMS has uh, been providing uh, high-performance sensors of various types over the years. Uh, one uh, gyro in particular is this silicon uh, disc resonator uh, gyro that um, that uh, Boeing and uh, JPL and HRL have been uh, working on for the last uh, oh, eight years or so. Uh, both need electronics. Uh, hopefully, the eventually the electronics will be buried in a silicon substrate, um, and both can benefit from uh, ovenization to eliminate uh, slow thermally driven drifts. Um, so the question then uh, that was up to our, the fabrication guys at HRL was, can we integrate um, something at uh, preferably VHF uh, frequencies you know, as a quartz oscillator in with this very high aspect ratio, very large uh, silicon uh, inertial sensor on the same wafer? And we were constrained at the time uh, with this package, uh, this LCC package. Uh, Boeing had invested quite a bit of money and HRL had too to develop this LCC small package that this device would fit into quite snugly. Um, it provided a, a very good vacuum of uh, less than a millitor, uh, which we had tested over a period of about five or six years. We knew it didn't leak. Um, so there was a, a, a big emphasis on not changing this package and all the infrastructure that went along with doing the vacuum packaging. So we wanted to integrate this clock in with this guy. And so we had the idea of, can we uh, put a clock in the base of the, uh, of the gyro? So this is a, a ring structure, multi-ring structure with a roughly two millimeter uh, silicon base. And um, we thought, well, if we could uh, make a very small SC cut clock that would fit into this base, we wouldn't increase the overall die size, and um, we'd have uh, two things integrated together. So, so we set us set upon the task of putting a, a small circular SC cut uh, resonator in the base of this guy and seeing whether we could uh, fab the whole thing with heaters and RTDs uh, buried underneath. 
And if we could ovenize uh, both of them, we felt like in a common housing, um, we could uh, uh, save power. Uh, we were in, concurrently working on a uh, isolation platform that would fit in this package that would isolate the, um, the gyro substrate uh, from stress, um, mechanical stress, and um, thermally isolate it from the package. So the idea was to make this chip, integrate it on the uh, isolation platform, and then put it in the LCC package for the final vacuum. So let me um, uh, start by uh, giving you a little a tutorial or a little background on the uh, gyro itself. Um, we made a, uh, a little custom double oven. We wanted to um, ensure that uh, we minimized uh, uh, fan vibrations, uh, electromagnetic interference that can come in from a commercial oven. And uh, we made this uh, double oven and it's uh, it uh, consists of an inner copper housing. And you can see here in cross-section, this is the top uh, copper uh, housing, and this is the bottom housing. And this card here is the uh, front-end electronics for the gyro. So it contains trans-impedance amplifiers and the electronics that take all the signals from the gyro, and they get, uh, uh, through a bundle of cables, they, uh, they come out and go to the uh, other uh, sustaining circuits and control circuits for the gyro. Those are all outside uh, this oven. And um, then we have an outer uh, housing, this uh, aluminum uh, housing that is broken open right now, but it was um, uh, enclosed and had uh, heaters and RTDs and uh, thermocouples and a thermal blanket that all went around it. So we, we formed this double oven to try to control the temperature down into the millikelvin uh, range. And, um, uh, you can see uh, we uh, have various uh, thermocouples, one right on the lid of the uh, LCC, and then some in the, uh, within the outer oven, and then some on the outer oven um, to control the temperature. And once we stabilize the temperature at about 30 degrees, we raise the temperature uh, by one degree C, and we looked at the uh, frequency, the gyro frequency, and the gyro uh, rate bias uh, sensitivity. And what we found was that the, uh, the frequency of the gyro changed by about minus 33 parts per million per degree C. Um, and, the, and that was pretty, uh, that was, that was uh, suspected and uh, not too uh, surprising because it's a silicon device and that's about what uh, the uh, temperature coefficients of uh, silicon are just based on the elastic uh, changes in the, uh, in the structure. The rate uh, gyro rate bias changed by about seven degrees per hour per degree C. And this is a more complicated uh, functionality. This not only has to do with the structural changes and the elastic changes in the structure, but the dimensional changes in the gaps and, and stresses and various things. So it's, it's a very complicated thing to try to model. Um, but uh, that's, that's the sensitivity and that uh, was typical for these uh, particular uh, gyros. Okay, um, so again, once it, the, the oven was stabilized, um, uh, and it was stable to within, uh, in this particular con oven configuration to about uh, three millikelvin, plus or minus three millikelvin, uh, we looked at the uh, correlation between the, fre the frequency and the um, DRG temperature taken from the lid of the LCC package, and you can see a very good correlation. Uh, just about every blip here you see in one of the uh, curves you see as an anti-blip in the, in the other curve. In fact, the, uh, the correlation um, in temperature was better than uh, 50 microkelvin and uh, in frequency uh, better than uh, uh, two parts per billion over, uh, over a long period of time of about 14 hours. So uh, we concluded that we definitely could use the uh, frequency uh, to predict temperature over uh, typically long uh, time scales uh, useful for uh, gyro uh, navigation. And um, we have a lot more data if you're interested. Uh, we gave a talk at the IEEE Inertial Sensors uh, Conference in February in Laguna Beach, and you can check out our paper uh, on that. So um, 
So w once uh, we established that we had this very good correlation between the uh, frequency and the temperature, you can envision putting, again, both of them in some sort of common housing. Um, and uh, since the, uh, the quartz uh, resonator should have parts per billion stability over temperature if it's ovenized, um, and the gyro is in the parts per million, you, you have a situation almost like you have for an MCXO. You have two modes, in this case, two, uh, a silicon resonator and a quartz resonator with different uh, thermal sensitivities. And you can use the difference over temperature as a um, local uh, temperature sensor. So if you ovenize the housing and uh, uh, use the divider to divide down a higher frequency a quartz resonator and a PLL circuit to create an error signal, uh, and using then a heater controller as the feedback mechanism, um, we are we're hoping to um, control the bias drift of the gyro um, over, over a wide range of temperatures. So just to give you an example, um, for this particular uh, gyro, we, we just measured, we had about 33 parts per million per degree C uh, frequency stability. If you lock that quartz uh, clock uh, to, a, um, to an uh, ovenized oscillator with, say, 3 times 10 to the minus 9 stability uh, over temperature and over, say, a 10 to the 4 uh, second time period, uh, you would expect to effectively um, uh, stabilize the uh, temperature of the gyro to about 100 microkelvin, and that's much, uh, much more accurate by order of magnitude or so, uh, uh, better than what you can do with uh, just a very simple oven. Um, now, if the uh, gyro then has a uh, thermal coefficient of rate bias of, say, minus 7 degrees per hour per degree C, then that 100 uh, microkelvin uh, temperature control gives us about 7 times 10 to the minus 4 uh, degrees per hour uh, rate bias control over temperature. And if you're familiar with uh, gyro uh, technology, uh, ten, uh, something in the 10 to the minus 4 range is uh, definitely down in the navigation grade uh, uh, and it's extremely interesting uh, to a lot of uh, customers. So that's sort of the motivation. And um, so the fabrication then uh, issues are uh, several. Uh, one is we've previously given uh, presentations of this uh, symposium uh, on UHF uh, quartz uh, resonators. And in those cases, the, the quartz, this is showing a quartz strip design, AT cut, uh, bonded to a silicon substrate. And uh, last year we presented this, uh, uh, these results on monolithic crystal filters. Uh, again, UHF uh, AT cut uh, crystal filters. This is about a one millimeter by one millimeter die, so they're fairly small. Um, but how do we get to uh, a more stable uh, SC cut ovenized design uh, requiring uh, VHF uh, um, operation? Well, we have to increase the quartz thickness from you know, in the several micron range to, say, 50 or above. Um, and that uh, required us uh, changing the uh, resist mask from, or changing the mask for doing the quartz etching from resist to an aluminum um, metal mask. And more importantly, uh, the heat load. Um, this is something that may not be obvious initially, but the heat loading during the quartz etching and during the uh, handle wafer, silicon handle wafer etching that we were using um, became a big problem. Um, wafers cracked like crazy and our yield went to zero uh, with that process. So we couldn't use this process uh, to make a VHF uh, part. So we had to switch um, from using a, a quartz silicon fusion bond uh, to bond the uh, active region to our active layer to the uh, subst uh, handle wafer while we were processing it um, to a adhesive bond and we went from a dry plasma etch of the uh, of the handle wafer to a chemical etch to remove the uh, adhesive. Um, so that was uh, a fairly uh, substantial change in the process, and I'll show you where that comes in um, in a few minutes. So the process, and uh, if you're not a process person, uh, forgive me, uh, but 
uh, the real key here is in all the little details of the processing. So let me step you through uh, the processing. We start with a silicon uh, 100 base wafer. That uh, was typical for the gyro processing. Uh, we didn't do a lot of modifications to the silicon base process. Uh, we first etch uh, pillars in the, uh, in the silicon base to, for standoffs, for bonding eventually the silicon uh, gyro. Um, we oxidize the surface and um, we do a first level aluminum interconnect. The interconnects for the gyro are quite complicated and uh, they were all uh, previously had been done with aluminum. Uh, we then added uh, a, a, some platinum RTD and heater elements uh, to the center. This is the center pillar. And then we uh, uh, applied a PECVD oxide layer for uh, isolation between the uh, first level and the second level metal. And then we applied uh, second level aluminum interconnects uh, to bring the, uh, the interconnects out to the edge of the die. Uh, this was a, sort of our one of our Achilles heels during the process. The interconnect, the via interconnect resistance actually turned out to be higher than we expected between the two layers of aluminum. And uh, we need to do a better job of, of keeping that interconnect resistance um, at that via uh, down by possibly doing some in-situ plasma or sputter cleaning uh, during the uh, final aluminum deposition. Um, but I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, then we applied uh, gold bonds, uh, gold pads for uh, bonding the uh, silicon device. This is very similar to the way we processed the silicon DRG in the past. And then what we added, uh, an indium dot, or a couple of indium dots right here in the middle um, uh, for the uh, quartz bonding. So we decided to put the quartz down first and uh, then uh, follow up with the silicon processing. So the quartz uh, processing is, is sort of, if uh, you followed our uh, VHF processing in the past, it's similar with some, a few modifications. Uh, we start out with now uh, both a quartz handle wafer and a quartz resonator uh, layer. Uh, we bond those now with an adhesive bond instead of with a fusion bond. This is a wax uh, bond that uh, we bake at about 150 degrees C. Uh, we uh, thin the uh, quartz. Uh, this is now an SC cut uh, quartz wafer, not an AT cut quartz wafer. Uh, we polish it, grind and polish it uh, down, uh, CMP um, polish it, and uh, deposit uh, now our metal mass uh, for doing uh, at the same whoop, doing the same time the uh, via and the um, the resonator etch. Uh, then we uh, apply the via metal and bond pad metal, and finally the uh, bottom electrode metal. Then we flip this whole structure over um, and, and bond it uh, to the uh, substrate, uh, the silicon gyro substrate wafer, um, and finally uh, release the adhesive um, in a PECVD, uh, 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 PEC uh, release, and um, remove the handle wafer. Now these uh, scales are not uh, not correct. Uh, you'll see in a few minutes the, uh, the quartz device is very very small compared to the uh, geometry of the uh, of the silicon DRG. Um, so finally, the last step is uh, then merging the uh, the gyro integration. So uh, we go back to put on our silicon MEMS hat and. Uh, uh, now we add a 111 uh, heavily boron dope uh, silicon wafer to the uh, top of the structure. We bond it to the uh, existing gold pads with a um, gold to gold thermal compression bond and uh, then etch with uh, deep RIE uh, the, uh, the gyro structure. And uh, that leaves us with a wafer then uh, that we can, um, we can test in the vacuum station. Um, Ultimately, uh, we were hoping and we would like to move forward and uh, do a wafer level capping of the structure. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, put the whole structure on an isolation platform uh, that would uh, mitigate stress and uh, allow us to go to a low power operation to isolate the, uh, the die from the outside environment. So we first had to um, design this very small uh, SC cut quartz resonator. 
And uh, this shows some uh, COMSOL uh, modeling uh, that we did. Um, uh, we decided to just stick with a uh, simple fundamental mode uh, operation initially. Uh, the entire structure was put into uh, a COMSOL uh, FEA program. Uh, we included a uh, MESA step, uh, the, the uh, inner MESA's uh, 22 uh, microns. There's a half micron step on each side to give us an outer MESA of 21 microns. Uh, we used uh, 0.15 microns of gold. You can see that there's some activity out in the, uh, out in the uh, regions outside, so we didn't do an exceptionally good job of, of uh, minimizing activity dips or uh, our uh, uh, mode uh, encroachment out into the, the Mesa region, uh, but we only had a month or so to do this design and then get on with the fabrication, so I think we can do better uh, in the future. Uh, we did add uh, these uh, sort of unique uh, rounded tethers. These are the bond regions to isolate the device uh, from stress. Um, and uh, stress is always um, an important factor uh, when you're integrating these uh, 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 quartz devices on silicon uh, to maintain a low stress in the active region. Uh, this shows the, uh, our stress calculations that we did on these uh, rounded and, and curved tethers. Um, this is taking a bonded device that's solidly bonded to silicon, to 100 silicon, uh, from room temperature up to 80 degrees. And uh, you can see the, the tethers are doing their, their job. Uh, this is uh, a stress uh, plot uh, with a range between zero and uh, 10 megapascals. And uh, the, the white is uh, off scale. So the white is over 10 megapascals, but you can see it quickly drops uh, to a fairly low level in the active region. Uh, this is a, a wider scale from zero to one megapascal and you can see you're still uh, very low in the, in the active region. So you've got all the stress drop uh, along the tethers. Um, it's actually about 40 kilopascals uh, variation between room temperature and 80 degrees in the active region. And we found for our uh, previous uh, EHF parts that if you're in the 10 to 40 uh, kilopascal uh, total uh, stress, uh, range, um, it won't uh, rotate your, uh, or affect your uh, FT profiles. So that was the uh, design uh, we picked. And um, we did the uh, admittance uh, optimization. Uh, this is just single parameter optimization. You, know, you can do multi-parameter optimization within, uh, within our COMSOL models by looking, uh, varying uh, the uh, the outer mesa, uh, the, uh, the uh, designs of the electrodes, uh, the um, configuration of the electrodes, etc. Uh, we just looked at one uh, parameter, uh, which was the outer mesa thickness, uh, and varied that. And we chose uh, one, as I mentioned, around 21 microns, which gave us a R1 of around uh, 13 ohms and a predicted Q of over, uh, over 100,000. And this was, by the way, for a 75 megahertz uh, SC cut design. So uh, once we had that design in place, we uh, did some test uh, uh, fabs on some wafers just to see whether we could uh, bond this thing and uh, make it uh, to the uh, design. This shows uh, the SC cut uh, resonator bonded to a test uh, silicon substrate. And you can see, um, these uh, cutouts that we put into the uh, uh, pillars uh, for bonding the, the gyro structure to, and these cutouts serve two purposes. One is to allow us to bring in interconnects uh, to the uh, to the gyro to the uh, resonator here, quartz resonator, um, and interconnects for the heater and the RTD that we had uh, we had buried underneath underneath the uh, quartz resonator. You can see here the the 22 micron uh, plasma etch. A profile. It's very clean. Um, this is a you know doubly rotated crystal, so you'd expect if it was wet etched, you'd uh, get a lot of different uh, angles on the uh, edge. Uh, nice and clean uh, structure with the with the tethers defined. Now as I mentioned there's a big difference between the size that we were dealing with, and that sort of played to our advantage in some cases. Uh, in other cases, it was a it was a potential uh, problem. Uh, this 
is a four inch silicon uh, DRG wafer. Uh, and what I show here in red in the circle is the size of the uh, two inch SC cut quartz wafer that we were using. I, I believe if we really pushed some of the vendors, we probably could have gotten three inch, but it would have taken some extra tooling and time. So uh, we stuck with what we had in house of, uh, of, of two inch SC cut wafers. So you can see the, the gyro uh, pattern here, eight millimeters in size. And what you see is the little red dots. Those are the quartz resonators buried inside the, uh, the bond, uh, central bond area. So we uh, had uh, 39 silicon DRGs on this four inch wafer, uh, 12 of which uh, had, the, um, had the SC cut uh, resonators buried uh, buried inside that uh, inner circle. There. So we, we sacrificed uh, quite a few of the uh, DRGs uh, just for this uh, demonstration purpose. This uh, then is the is a layout. It's not an actual fab wafer, but it's uh, you can see the complexity of the uh, the gyro structure. So we were dealing with a fairly complex MEMS gyro that we were embedding this quartz uh, resonator into. Um, all of these are the, uh, the, all the interconnects and the pillars and all for the, uh, the gyro structure. And the uh, quartz resonator is right here, this tiny little spot right there. Um, you can see it better over here. Um, it, it goes in this region and underneath it, there was a, a heater and an RTD structure for measuring the temperature. And we brought those, uh, all the interconnects out uh, through these, uh, these uh, segments here in the uh, base. These segments serve both uh, allow us to get the, uh, get the um, interconnects in and out, but also when we pump out, uh, eventually we want the, the uh, silicon uh, DRG and the quartz uh, uh, resonator to be under vacuum. So these, were pump these served as pump out ports as well to the, uh, to the quartz. You can see uh, how far we had to run the interconnects for the uh, resonator, the quartz resonator, uh, out to the edge of the die. So these are actually the probe pads for the quartz resonator. Uh, so these long interconnects uh, increase the uh, uh, R1 of the uh, quartz resonator that I had to take that into account when we did the final measurements. Um, you know, we would uh, try to improve that. We would uh, increase the thickness and the width of the interconnect metal. Um, we could uh, go to a design where the R1 wasn't, didn't start out at 13 ohms, so it wouldn't, uh, the interconnect resistance wouldn't have as big a uh, effect. And then ultimately, we were thinking, you know, if we run it into the uh, silicon substrate itself where all the electronics is, uh, we would just go directly down. We wouldn't be running things out all the way out here. We'd just be going directly through a via into the silicon substrate uh, to uh, attach to the sustaining circuit for the uh, quartz resonator. So that would, that would solve that problem. The, um, the issue that I mentioned on the, uh, the difference in sizes is really shown here. Um, the, these are the, uh, the quartz uh, resonators, and uh, the circle here is the eight millimeter diameter uh, silicon DRG. Uh, if we were just processing uh, quartz resonators, we'd have these things packed as close together as we could for the optimal uh, use of the real estate. Um, because, there's, because we're integrating it in with the silicon DRG, they're spread apart. And so then when we bond uh, this structure to this uh, uh, silicon substrate, there's a very, very low bond area. And we were actually afraid that uh, they just wouldn't hold together just in handling. So we actually added some extra sort of just um, a sacrificial bond areas. Uh, so these extra little pads here are just for bonding uh, to try to hold things together. We didn't have a problem, as it turned out, so we didn't go back and take remove these extra little sacrificial areas. Um, but uh, you can see um, it's, it's a completely different situation than uh, if you were just processing uh, one type of device. So this shows now, this is an actual uh, picture of the completed uh, silicon base wafer with the embedded uh, platinum heaters and RTDs and the aluminum interconnects going out. Um, this shows the, uh, the heater again and the RTD uh, and the bond uh, sites for the uh, quartz. Uh, the, we tested the RTD 
and heater resistances, and we were calculating about 100, 130 ohms. We were getting about 140, 147 ohms. Uh, the big um, uh, issue that we had was we calculated the uh, interconnect resistance uh, for the uh, quartz device of about uh, 10 ohms through these uh, aluminum interconnects. And as I mentioned, through the vias, uh, uh, we did a poor job at, at keeping that uh, via resistance down, and we were getting more like 50 or 70 ohms round trip. Uh, so that uh, decreased the Q, uh, and I took that into account uh, when we uh, made the final measurements. This then uh, shows the integrated uh, uh, quartz devices on the silicon base wafer. Uh, you can see the, these are the gold indium bonds. They had to survive up to the 360 or so bond for the uh, silicon device uh, in a subsequent step. Um, this is the VS uh, within the, in the thick quartz. Uh, taking the top metal down to the uh, bottom uh, bond metal. And this is just a, a lower view uh, a picture of the entire wafer. Uh, so these are all the, um, the uh, uh, devices uh, bonded to the base wafer, and you can see the, uh, the, the quartz resonator right there. So now we go to uh, the silicon processing uh, this is a test uh, wafer where we uh, use this uh, Bosch etch, uh, an SF6 based etch, uh, to uh, uh, etch the uh, heavily doped uh, boron silicon layer. Uh, you can see we're etching down about 275 microns, uh, getting pretty good fidelity of the uh, silicon etch. Uh, this, this would be the resonator uh, section of the gyro, and these uh, uh, sections that are bonded are the electrodes, the inner electrodes for the silicon DRG that uh, are, are uh, energized by the uh, outside circuit. So this then is the completed, uh, what a completed uh, structure looks like. We, um, we lost uh, three uh, gyros here during the bonding, but the others uh, survived. Um, and this then is the, uh, the finished uh, gyro and you've got the uh, quartz uh, resonator buried right in here in the base wafer, uh, or on the base wafer uh, underneath that, uh, that uh, post. So um, again, we uh, did the uh, silicon uh, bonding, uh, gold to gold bonding at three, uh, around 365, and then we tested the, uh, the gyros in a vacuum probe station uh, that we had with a probe card for the gyros at about a 10 to minus five tor vacuum. We tested the, um, uh, the uh, quartz devices with, uh, with just uh, on a hot plate or on a hot chuck uh, with uh, Cascade Microtech probes uh, in air. So our first data showed um, a very good performance on the silicon device um, and a reasonably uh, good match with our models on the uh, quartz uh, device as well. So. This is the uh, measured FT profile of the quartz MEMS device measured in air. Uh, the Q, after I corrected for this uh, increase in uh, interconnect resistance of 50 or 70 ohms, uh, in air was about 64K. Uh, we would expect it to be over 100K in the vacuum. Um, and it did show the two, amazingly enough, the two activity dips that the model uh, predicted. It didn't quite have the, the uh, flatter region between about 80 and 100 degrees C that we were expecting. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but we clearly need to um, do a little bit better design on the, uh, on the quartz. Um, on the silicon side, uh, the resonators passed. Uh, there's a lot of uh, possibilities for open and shorts on these complicated structures. They passed uh, mostly the open short testing. Uh, the Qs were around 80,000, which was comparable to what we've seen on just standalone um, silicon DRG devices in a vacuum. And the, uh, the frequency splits were actually very good, around uh, uh, 1 hertz, and these were operating around 15 kilohertz. Uh, actually, this one's more like the 10 kilohertz, I guess. Uh, but typically, they were operating, they operated around 14 kilohertz. Okay, so um, where do we go from here? Uh, the optimization of the SC cut resonators uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, we simply uh, did a, a few things quickly uh, towards the end of the program, and that was just to move uh, to a higher frequency design, 100 megahertz, and change the uh, theta angle slightly um, to, um, to see whether we could uh, 
improve the performance. So we uh, increased the theta angle a little, and we got this uh, sort of FP profile. Still has some wiggles in it, but it's uh, clearly got rid of the, uh, the major activity dips. And um, what we would probably um, need to do is, again, do a multi-parameter optimization. Uh, we could also increase or decrease the electrode dimensions to uh, increase the uh, inherent R1, uh, move the uh, electrodes away from the edge a little bit. Uh, I think all that would, would help in the uh, performance of the uh, quartz and, um, and clearly uh, reduce, this, uh, reduce some of this uh, interconnect resistance by improving those, uh, those via uh, steps. So um, to summarize, then we, uh, I think we were uh, very successful at uh, for sort of our first attempt at integrating these quartz MEMS devices in with the uh, silicon MEMS uh, on a common silicon substrate. Um, the process is compatible with fully integrating the microsystem, including uh, passes and active electronics uh, in the substrate and with wafer level packaging. Uh, we've done the wafer level packaging on the silicon DRG. Uh, we haven't uh, incorporated in this uh, dual structure. Um, by taking advantage of uh, the dimensional differences of the typical quartz and the silicon MEMS devices, uh, these multiple etch steps uh, could be realized for these high aspect ratio structures without damaging the uh, sensitive uh, device uh, regions, as you might. Uh, suspect if we had the uh, quartz device outboard of the of the uh, of the silicon device, or we didn't have it covered with a protective coating, then that long uh, deep RIE etch of the silicon uh, gyro would uh, would really degrade the uh, the quartz performance. Um, when we integrate it, we showed we could integrate the uh, heaters and, and RTDs locally uh, to minimize the uh, time constants and the power. And uh, finally, uh, we're uh, hoping to uh, demonstrate this frequency locking uh, technique uh, soon on uh, another uh, program that we have that we just got started with uh, to uh, show that the, um, uh, that the thermal stability of the gyro can be greatly improved without a, a size penalty uh, for the overall structure. And I'd like to, uh, again, acknowledge uh, the support of DARPA MTO office and also a Boeing a Research and Technology for Electronic and Gyro Tuning Support. Thank you very much.